This is a brief video on pelvic inflammatory disease. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of pelvic inflammatory disease, sometimes called PID. As in all of these videos, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right. And I'll clear all of the boxes and talk through them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started. So pelvic inflammatory disease starts with an infection in the lower genital tract. So that's an infection in the vagina or in the cervix of a female. Then when this infection ascends to infect the upper reproductive tract, this can cause pelvic inflammatory disease. Now that upper reproductive tract includes the endometrium, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and or the peritoneal cavity. Remember that the female reproductive tract is connected um, to the peritoneal cavity. There's actually open space between the peritoneal cavity and the upper, GI, or upper GU tract in women. So let's get into the etiology of pelvic inflammatory disease. We can break this down into risk factors for the ascending infection, as well as pathogens that cause the lower genital tract infection to begin with. We'll start with the pathogens. By far the most common are chlamydia and gonorrhea. So chlamydia trichomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea are by far the most infections that are gonna start and lead to PID. These are some other bugs that can be involved, E. coli, urea plasma, mycoplasma, and other anaerobes. But it's worth knowing that these are much less common and if you do see these, you should consider co-infections with chlamydia and gonorrhea. So really consider chlamydia and gonorrhea, the two most common causes of, uh, of STIs in women also cause PIDs. Now let's get into the risk factors for the ascending affection. Start with the risk factors for getting an STI in general, so multiple sexual partners, unprotected sex, history of prior STIs. In addition, if you have an imbalance in intravaginal flora, uh, flora, also called vaginal dysbiosis, that can predispose you to the ascending infection. And there has been some studies that show IUDs increase your chances of pelvic inflammatory disease. This is, again, through increasing the risk of pathogen ascension, and it's worth noting that this is, in modern devices, only really a risk in the first few weeks after IUD placement. They still highly recommend IUDs because after these first two or three weeks, your risk of pelvic inflammatory disease goes back to normal. So it really shouldn't deter you from getting an intrauterine device. All right, so we've talked about the definition. It's when an infection ascends into the upper reproductive tract. When it ascends into these specific structures, the corresponding inflammation has a specific name. So if the infection goes up to the endometrium, you can have endometritis. If it goes up into the fallopian tubes, you can have salpingitis. In the ovaries, you could have ophoritis. In the uterine adnexa, you can have adnexitis. In the surrounding pelvis, you can have parametritis. In the peritoneum, you can have peritonitis. Now let's talk about the manifestations. First, there are a bunch of symptoms you can get from pelvic inflammatory disease. There's usually a bilateral lower abdominal pain first with um, adnexal tenderness sometimes and um, cervical motion tenderness might be the descriptions that you see for PID. You can get nausea and vomiting. You can have fever like with any infection. You can have problems with urination, dysuria, urinary urgency. You can have menorrhagia or metorrhagia. This is heavy menstrual bleeds, this is bleeding in between your menstrual cycles. You can have dyspareunia, that's pain with sex, and you can have abnormal vaginal discharge, and it can be like a yellow green uh, color, which is abnormal for vaginal discharge. Next, let's talk about the complications. We'll start with some of the acute complications. A pelvic inflammatory disease can cause pelvic peritonitis, which in serious cases can lead to acute abdomen. You can also have inflammation of the liver capsule, or a perihepatitis. In this case, when it comes from pelvic inflammatory disease, it's called Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. This is characterized on pathology by violin string-like adhesions from the peritoneum to the liver. And you have a characteristic right upper quadrant abdominal pain. So if a woman of reproductive age who has a history of STIs and unprotective sex has lower abdominal pain for a few days and then it later progresses to a right upper quadrant abdominal pain, and then she might also have some liver symptoms, you might suspect Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. In addition, you can have an abscess from this infection, a tubo-ovarian abscess, which is a pus collection in the uterine adnexa. This can spread to the adjacent organs like the bowel and the bladder as well.
Some of the more dreaded complications of pelvic inflammatory disease are ectopic pregnancies and infertility, and these happen through a number of structural reasons. First, we already discussed that when the infection spreads up into the uterine adnexa, you have adnexitis, so you have this inflammation in the uterine adnexa, and these are the structural factors that I was mentioning. So you can have, from the infection, you can get ovarian adhesions, fallopian tube adhesions, and tubal scarring. These all prevent the cilia in the fallopian tubes from working normally. And if the scarring and the adhesions get really bad, you can actually have tubal occlusion. This will prevent the egg from going from the ovaries through the fallopian tubes into the uterus, which is something you need for normal fertility. And it's also something that predisposes the egg to being stuck in the fallopian tubes and causing an ectopic pregnancy there. So this is why pelvic inflammatory disease can predispose you to ectopic pregnancies and infertility. In addition, these structural problems can also lead to a collection of fluid or pus in the fallopian tubes. This is called hydrosalpinx or pyosalpinx. And lastly, you can have chronic pain from pelvic inflammatory disease. So some women who have had PID end up with chronic pelvic pain. This has been a short overview of pelvic inflammatory disease. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.